Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm your host, Tom Vassell. And let's start off with our contest that we've been running, Extraordinary Adventures uh, Pirates. Big giant contest. Did you win? Easy enough. Check the description of this video. I put the names of the winners down there. Congratulations. Uh, and we'll be in contact with you to talk more about that. Whoa, oh, also, this is something you'll have to work on really quickly. But our cruise, which is coming up in January, really, really soon, right around the corner, um, a couple things worked out and we have a few extra rooms. I'm talking about just a few of them. If you want to get in one of these rooms, you need to get it. I mean, you probably need to do it today because they're, they're already filling up. Um, if again, there's just not many of them left at all. So just email us at cruise at dicetower.com if you're interested. PAX Unplugged is this week. Huzzah! We will be there. I'll be there. Sam, Z, uh, and Eric, Mandy and Suzanne, and uh, several of the other contributors for the Dice Tower. And so we'll all be there. And so come by our booth and say hi to us. We'll have some promos and things there. We're also going to be running, uh, we'll be doing a top five list there. We'll be uh, doing, a, I'll be doing a teach and play for role player. And then after we're done with that, the learn and play night on Saturday, you'll be able to come and game with us in that room. Bring some games, of course. Uh, I'll have a few with me, but not too many. So come on out and join us there. And let's see. Uh, well, we're going to be doing a few uh, live plays today. So Monday, I'll be doing a few live plays. I'll be doing a Q&A today at 9 o'clock. And then we'll be doing a few live plays after that. Uh, tomorrow at noon, we'll be doing our top 10 games of all time live. Just thought we'd try that out for fun. So we'll be doing that live. What games? Has anything changed? Has it not changed? Who knows? Either way, it hopefully will be entertaining. So come on in and talk to us live as we do that. Alrighty. With that being said, though, it's time to get to the news. Here we go. So let's take a look at the news for this week. First of all, Hans and Gluck and Z-Man Games have announced Liftoff. This is coming out this spring, a two to four player game about the golden age of space exploration. I love games about the golden age of space exploration, and most of them have been okay at best. So I'm hoping this one is a good one. A couple of conventions to talk about. First of all, MeepleCon. Now this one is just, it's not the same one that was running in Las Vegas each year. That one actually has changed the Dice Tower West. Um, but this is a MeepleCon in India. This is December 2nd, so right around the corner. They expect 3,000 people in Mumbai. So if you're in India, you got your own convention now. Fantastic. Then a much smaller con, Flamingo Con. This is January 5th. It's actually in South Florida, but because of other things, I won't be able to be there. But hopefully you can show up to this one, about 250 people. And this is in Delray Beach. So, so Flamingo Con is what you're looking for if you want to go to that. The Toy of the Year awards have been announced, and in the one game category, we have Villainous, uh, which, okay, big surprise there, from Disney, very popular theming. Um, Ch Chicago Toy and Game Association also announced their awards, and I'll be talking a little bit later about that in Tom Thinks. Board and Dice and NSKN games have merged. Board and Dice have the Escape Tale Awakening, which I'll be reviewing in a few weeks. Uh, spoiler, it's really good. Um, and NSKN has a lot of great games, so seeing them come together, we'll have to wait and see what that means in the long run, but excited about that. Fantasy Flight has announced playmats for Keyforge. Keyforge seems to be, um, from what I can tell, almost sold out on a distribution level, extremely popular on launch. Now, we'll have to wait and see in the long run just how much staying power Keyforge is going to have. But right now, super popular. Uh, and Smash City, this is a new kid from WizKids, Kaiju, giant monsters smashing each other. Looks like a bit of a dexterity game where your Kaiju is a dice. That's kind of interesting. I tend to like Kaiju games, but none of them have really taken off other than King of Tokyo. So hopefully maybe this will be one of those. Well, there you have it. Let's keep moving. Hello, fellow gamers. I hope everybody had an amazing weekend of gaming. Now that the holidays are here, Kickstarter's probably gonna get a little bit slower, but I wanted to make sure and wish everybody a happy holiday before we all get into that holiday rush, okay? So, 
Let's get started on these Kickstarters. Featured this week, we have Reich Busters by Mythic Games. This is for one to four soldiers looking to cooperatively infiltrate Nazi headquarters and quietly complete mission objectives in the most heroic way possible. However, as you explore the grounds, you begin to find monstrous creatures that have been kept within the walls. This game requires you to use card management skills and tokens to help even the odds for about 90 minutes. And it comes with a campaign mode as well as a raid mode which creates unique setups on the fly with randomized maps, missions, and faction decks. Now, the minimum pledge for this game is $100, but if you're suddenly thinking, yeah, I'm going to need some more dice rolling, then maybe Onimaru by Penguin and Panda Productions would suit you better with their cooperative game for two to four demon hunters. Here, you'll be fighting off hordes of demons flowing from gates while dodging attacks and trying to take down the Oni leader. Players will be using dice combat and specialized cards for about 60 to 90 minutes while trying to save the realm in this challenging onslaught of demons trying to take over the board. A game like this is going to set you back $59, but our next game is going to put you to the test. Challenging you to create the Master Plan by ABBA Games. This tile laying game is for two to four city engineers trying to create the most prosperous city. Players will bid for buildings and plots of lands while trying to increase each of their buildings income and end game victory points by strategically placing favorable buildings next to their assets. This game takes 20 minutes per person to play and it'll cost you $46 to get started. However, I really loved how everyone plays on the same board so their actions directly affect every other player's turn. Next up, we have expansions and reprints for the week. First up, we have Luna Deluxe Edition by Tasty Minstrel Games. Now, this is going to be a Kickstarter exclusive game where they're only going to print enough for the Kickstarter backers as well as a little bit more for possibly some like convention sales. But what they're upgrading in this game is all metal coins and an insane amount of wooden tokens. I really do mean an insane amount. Any token that you might have used in the game, they're pretty much making a screen printed wooden version of it. So that's really exciting if you love Luna. Lastly, we have the Pitch Car expansion by Eagle Griffin Games. This adds a fancy little loop to your track with a ton of extra goodies available as add-ons like extra cars, bumpers, and yes, super slide power. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure to check it out. Other than that, thank you so much for joining me this week. If you want to see more about any of the Kickstarters that I mentioned here today, make sure to check me out at gloryhound.com. That's Gloryhound with two Ds as we go over all of the Kickstarters that I've talked about and discuss them in depth and why you should and shouldn't buy them. And I will see you guys all next week. I've got a war game that gets personal, it's tactical, boots on the ground, and it's got miniatures. Sergeants, Day of Days, published by Lost Battalion Games. So why is it personal? Well, in this game you get 10 hand-painted pewter miniatures that come with their own decks creating their own characters. If you die, you're dead. So you're gonna be careful. You're gonna make a stupid decision like charge a machine gun nest with a handgun with only two bullets left. You play this game? Well, a deck of cards creates a story which creates a great narrative and that's fantastic. And certain cards, when paired together, have events. What kind of events? A rocket barrage. So if there's a rocket barrage, you gotta pull a blast hit check. Another cool thing, the board is modular. Different scenarios, different terrain. So a certain scenario will say, put these tiles together, and this is what the board's gonna look like. So the way gameplay works is you're gonna have the Germans coming in on one side, check out the guy with the rocket launcher, the Panzerfaust, and you're gonna have the Americans coming in from another side. So this is what a full-on scenario might look like on the board. Those tanks are my tanks, do not come with the game, though they sell tank miniatures. You're gonna see different terrain on the maps. You're gonna see roads, houses, trees. If someone's hiding behind a tree, it's an obstacle. You can't just shoot that guy and you're gonna get him. There's dice roll modifiers, just like in a regular board game, but with miniatures. What I like about this game is that you're the captain and you've got your squad, so you want to take care of everybody and yourself. So, you send one of your guys in, he gets shot. Man, he was supposed to be your best man for the wedding. It's over. 
Days of Days is the base game. You want to expand? No problem. They've got the Road to Quarantin, La Fier Bridge, Red Devils, and also Brecourt Manor. Day of Days, one to two player game, takes about two to three hours, medium complexity, speed of the game is very high, replayability is very high, so check them out on Lost Battalion Games. Thank you for watching, and this game has a lot more than I can cram in for two minutes. If you want to know more about war games, check out my channel, No Enemies Here. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Dude, Dice Tower. Breakfast, sir. Come here, come here, come here. We found a banned game at a thrift store. We found store. a banned game. We can't play this game. We're not allowed to play this game, all right? It's slumber party. It's slumber party. It's just for girls, though. Just for girls. We're not girls, though. I don't. I know you think we're not. But we're not, so check it out, though. But what we're going to do for you, we're going to review it anyway. Because we're rebels. We're rebels, dude. We're off the grid like that. All right, but you can't tell the girls that we play the game. Get the this. Get the all right, this is Slumber Party. Slumber Party, each person is going to get five rollers, which you can put in your hair or not. And this is one of those dumb little party games where essentially you're going to draw the top card of the deck and you have to do something. Like, this is a stupid stunt. Hold your tongue between your fingers and say, she sells, she sells, down by the seashore three times. Ha 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 Basically, what you're trying to do is trying to get rid of all five of your rollers. So certain cards allow you to give rollers. Some cards make you take rollers. Sometimes you have a who am I, which means you put on the, your forehead and then other people have to do like 20 question stuff to get you to guess it there's also take a break cards which means everyone has to take a break for 15 minutes and eat pizza and stuff there's a dear diary thing and this literally just has a pad a yellow paper on it it's so weird that's it done so that was slumber party just for girls or whoever i mean whoever let's be honest uh so um this is whatever man this game is it, it's fun i like that it comes with hair rollers that's a lot better components than most stefan felt games it's terrible but it's just like it's a little kids game that kids play like a little slow i don't think anyone actually has ever done this but i do like they have take a break like every game should be like hey everyone take a break for 15 minutes go get some pizza and like I think this game is clearly sponsored by Domino's. Yeah. Uh, Nick pointed out that there's like very clearly a mom coming in like, just got some fresh Domino's. And this is back in the day, Fresh Domino's. hot, right off the oven, yeah. Yeah, and then there's this like, take a break, eat a snack. One certain kind of snack. And you know, but I'm like, hey, power to you. I like the idea that it's just like, it's going to cultivate an evening for you. <laughs> yeah. Someone played this game, they'd be done. It's like, take a break, man. It's like a lifestyle Come back game. to the summer party. It's an all-night affair. <laughs> there's so many rollers to use. Uh, but yeah, that's all we got to say about this one. <laughs> anyway, check us out on YouTube. Uh, check us out over on Twitch as well. If you want to watch us play live games, it's super fun, super cool community. Indeed. And um, since we can't predict the future, our top 100 may be on the Dice Tower right now. It's possible. We'll see you at, at Casey's Thomas. house at 3 a.m. <laughs> well, we're not asleep, but we should be. <laughs> <laughs> So what's coming out from the Dice Tower uh, this week? Well, first of all, I already mentioned a Q&A today and the top 100 of all time tomorrow. Those are the big things. And some live playing today. Not a ton because we're getting ready for packs and things like that. I will be reviewing Neom, a city building game, Ward Around 2, Troll Park, Cake Duet, Get Packing, uh, the... Uh, Fluff, Smartphone Incorporated, and the Colonies expansion for Terraforming Mars. So I'm sure some people are interested in that. Uh, as the week goes by, we'll also be posting other reviews from Sam and Z and some other folks in our, from our contributors. So there'll be lots of videos all week long. And of course, if you're going to be at PAX, you can see us live. That's where we'll be spending a good chunk of our time. Alrighty. Uh, Dice Tower podcast, Dice Tower tonight this Wednesday, and on Wednesday also we'll be doing a, uh, no, yes, no, no, sorry, I'm all confused, it's just Dice Tower tonight on Wednesday, our other live Wednesday thing will be the following week, but you don't need to worry about that for right now, let's keep moving on to Board Game Breakfast. Happy breakfast everybody, today I'm going to talk to you about Trap Words, it's a taboo-like game that's just been released from Czech Games Edition, and it's got a bit of a theme, so why not talk about it? Now, it plays for four to eight players split into two teams. And as with a lot of these sort of games, splitting into two pairs, it doesn't quite work as well as when there's three people minimum per team. And it also can be a little unbalanced if you've got an odd number of players. The premise is that you're going through a dungeon. The two teams of you are trying to get through this dungeon, going through rooms, and eventually defeating the boss. It lasts a maximum of eight rounds, so there is a definitive end, 
And effectively, on your turn, you get a book. And it's got a little cutout window, and that shows you what word it's going to be. That can be a fancy word that helps keep the theme there, or it can be a non-fancy word if you're playing with people that maybe aren't that into fantasy. The trick here is, unlike other guessing word games where you're trying to explain this word to your team and they guess it, and you know what you can't say, the other team gets to write those words and you don't know them. You don't know these trap words at all. So you're really stumbling through giving clues, trying to not say what you think they might have written down as a clue. Each room has a number, and that's the number of words that they're going to be writing down. So as you go through the dungeon and the numbers ramp up, the more words you can't say. The theme isn't hugely strong, but it is there through the words and sort of the monster coming towards you. It's kind of a fun theme, but it's not too much there in case you're trying to play with non-gamers, which I kind of like, because otherwise I feel like, oh, we're going through a dungeon and guessing words. Some people might be put off by that. I'm certainly not, and it's definitely staying on the shelf for that party game sort of thing, definitely in the, uh, the lead up to Christmas. Anyway, that was Trap Words, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. Welcome to the Tantrum House After Party. We're looking at a gemstone mining game from USAopoly. We are going to talk about what we liked, what we hated, who won, and how. So this is a push your luck game. What did you like about the game, Xander? I like that you can pull the gems out of the bag. That's cool. Michael. What about you, Lincoln? I like the shape and the color. It was just really bright and I thought it was cool. These are really chunky pieces. They are fun to play with. What about you, Melissa? Well, I like that there are a variety of cards, but some of them aren't have a lot of take that because you're stealing things from other players. I liked that there are two modes of play. You can play with the cards if you have kids that can read or if you're willing to help them read their cards. I think the text on the cards is a little small, so you'll need to make sure that you have good lighting when you play this game. Also, you can play without the cards and just simply pull a gem out of the bag so you can play with little players. Yeah, the cards themselves have different modes as well. You can play with just the blue cards. Um, there's going to be that take that Melissa was saying, but there's also purple cards that sort of like defend yourself, which is fun in the game. Yeah, I enjoyed that they made this game up to seven players. A lot of times our family, we have five, and so those four player family games don't always work for us. So I'm glad that they added some extra players so even grandparents can join. In. So if you're looking for a push your luck type game, this is actually a re-theme of a game called Quartz with this dwarven theme. Um, if you like Snow White and uh, you want to be one of the seven dwarves like we were, that was kind of fun. You can check out our whole playthrough video that's on our channel as well. And be sure to subscribe to Tantrum House. Hi, I'm Jesse. And I'm Gil Mello, and this is Adventures of a Non-Board Gamer, where I teach my friend Jesse a new game every week, at least I try. What did we play this week, Jesse? Uh, it's called Spirits of the Forest. So how does that game and play? It's a uh, set collection uh, game, and you're collecting tiles, and the whole story is that you're venturing into the forest and you're picking up uh, various spirits of the forest. Yeah, the, so the game has those different tiles, and you set a greet. It's a game with uh, very few rules, a very simple game, I guess, uh, I should say. Um, and you can only collect tiles from the edges of the game. And as you go in, um, you can drop crystals to kind of reserve some of the tiles. Some of the tiles will have tokens that could give you an extra spirit or some uh, bonuses where you can retrieve some of your uh, crystal. Uh, it actually, it's kind of, there's a depth to the game for a game so simple. What yeah, there's, think there's, there's a strategy involved and you have to make sh sure you get all the spirits and you have to make sure that you get more than your opponent. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing of the game, that's the gist that is like only the person with the most spirit of that kind scores, uh, everybody else doesn't score anything. And on top of that, all the different tiles will have either a moon or a sun, and that will count into the end as well as a selection, or as a set, I should say. So what did you think of the game? Games aren't too simple. No? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you have to develop a strategy, and after you play it several times, you realize what you have to do. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, it's a 
Two thumbs up? Sure, why not? One, well, I'll give one thumbs up for yeah. me. Well, I I don't know. I uh, I liked it. it All right, fun. so it was fun. So Jesse, like, he probably has a better taste than me. So <laughs> thanks very much for watching. And happy breakfast, everybody. Hello everyone, my name is Annette and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of the estates. So this is a game all about auctioning and bidding. Every piece that you can play is always put up for auction. So let me show you a little bit about that and why I really like it. Players will always start with the same number of money, and before your turn you can always take one away and score it as a point at the end of the game. If you're going to pick a floor cube, you can only pick from the three that are on the edges, either to the left or the right. Once the active player puts something up for auction, the player to the left will decide how much money they're willing to bid on it, or they can pass. Whoever won the bid will be able to place it in the estates. They have to place it in one of the rows that's furthest to the right. If you were the first person to place this color cube, then you will take the stock for it, making you interested in this color value. Eventually, you'll be able to build on top of other buildings as long as the value is lower. Another thing you can also place into auction are the rooftops. You randomly draw one, place it up for the auction, and whoever takes it can build on top of any building. This building is then complete. Players can always bid on these building permits, which will actually extend, or they can shorten the game. If someone grabs the cancellation queue, then any previously built permits can easily be wiped out. And then, of course, the mayor's hat will double the points to any row wherever it's placed. The game will end either when two out of the three rows are complete, or there's no more buildings to put up for auction. All the buildings in a row that's complete will score positively. But if you're in a row that's not complete, all those values will be negative. So as you can see, there's not that many rules to the game because you just grab a piece and put it up for auction. The fun part about this game is that players are always engaged. Players are constantly outbidding each other or putting pieces in certain areas. It can be infuriating at times, but also a lot of fun. The players make the game. And that's why I really enjoy this game of the estates. Well, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Hey everyone, Gamer Joe here. A couple years ago, while I was at Gen Con, there was a card game that came out that used dice well before the craze that is Star Wars Destiny. But this game was very much an expandable card game, LCG, however you want to call it. But what drew my attention, of course, was the incredible artwork. So today I want to just show off a little bit of it. This game is called Ashes Rise of the Phoenix Born by Plat Hat Games and the incredible Fernanda Suarez. Fernanda's artwork first caught my eye in a little game you might have heard of called Dead of Winter. But for me, she took everything up a level with Ashes. Every card for me was a masterpiece from the Phoenix Born themselves to the allies you could call to your aid. Every card is fantastic in this game. This is one of the games that if I never played again, I can never get rid of it just because of the artwork alone. And the diversity amongst the Phoenix Born and the characters, allies in the game is just top notch. Here are some resources that you could check out if you wanna see some more of her work, as well as purchase some prints, etc. First up is of course her Facebook page, Fernanda Suarez Art, where you could see other works that she's done. Also, she provides links to some more resources on the internet. Next up is her Instagram page that shows off a ton of her work. It's one of my favorite resources to go to. It's at FDA Suarez. Go check that out. If you want to buy items with her artwork, I was just checking out her Society6 page. It's society, then the number six, dot com forward slash Fernanda Suarez. You can buy everything from prints to tote bags, pillows, bunch of stuff with her artwork on it. Last but not least is her DeviantArt page. It's www.deviantart.com forward slash FDA Suarez. I could truly be on this page for hours. Some of the pieces that really stand out to me are her realistic takes on some of the Disney princesses and their rivals. I'm hoping I could order some of these prints pretty soon. Well guys, that's all I have for you this week. We have packs coming up. I cannot wait. I've been waiting since last year. It's easily one of my favorite conventions and I hear that it's just gotten bigger. 
Um, so that's something I'm looking forward to. Check me out on all the various social media. And until next time, enjoy your breakfast. Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Coming to you very lo-fi this week. My computer is giving me problems. And on this Black Friday, the idea of going out to do anything about it is not really very appealing. So I'm coming to you with my shaky handheld phone in this cold and lifeless chamber. And I want to talk to you a little bit about a problem that I'm having outside of my computer, which is this. Oh, yes. Well, this is a stack of games, Pari, sorry about that, that I've decided that are no longer going to fit my collection. And so my question to myself is, what am I going to do with these games? I've considered the idea of doing a board game geek auction, and I like that idea, and I may still do it, but the idea of packing and shipping all of these games is dreadfully frightening to me, overwhelming, actually. I've thought about trying to do something where it's a, a local, no-ship option, but then I realize that I'm really limiting my pool of available potential buyers, and so I've considered, do I look for local game stores or charity uh, places that people might have use for the game or, or libraries, things along those lines, and maybe uh, donate the games, local game stores that have uh, libraries. So I've had a number of ideas and I just don't know where to go. If anyone has been in a situation like this where they've had a relatively large number of games that they've been uh, looking to remove from their collection uh, and have come up with a unique uh, solution for that, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for your time. Sorry for the uh, conditions this week, and have a great day. So I got a lot of requests from people asking what I thought about the Mojo Top 10 list that came out uh, a few weeks ago, where they talked about deep strategy games, and yeah, well, whatever. They suck on Scrabble and Monopoly and Risk, but they also put on Ticket to Ride, Carcassonne, and Catan. And you know what I thought about this. And I'm always conflicted when I see these things. Like when you see a major newspaper or somebody and they're like, here are the best board games of all time. And sometimes you look at it and go, do they even know about any of these board games? Well, you know what? The answer to that is pretty easy. No, they don't. Sometimes it's sloppy reporting. They just go out there and say, these are the best. But I often wonder, like, if someone looked at my, if I said, these are the best movies of all time, some movie critic might look at me and go, Pfft. Forget that. So I have to be cautious. On one hand, I want to be like, stop doing these dumb lists. But at the same time, I'm glad that people are talking about board games at all anyway. Uh, this kind of come focused home a little bit to me. I was looking at these, as I mentioned in the news, the Chicago Toy and Game Association. Now, the Chicago Toy and Game Association is trying to work hard to make board gaming a big business type thing. They have they have uh, meetings. They have they they help with the toy fair. Uh, they run this event every year that I've never gone to because if I'm have that week off, I'd probably rather go to Board Game Geek Con, which is always run the same week. And it's more of a fair where people go in and stuff. But they have these events and awards. And the most innovative game award this year went to Don't Step In It, which is a game where there is Play-Doh poop on the floor and you're trying not to step in that poop. And a couple other mass market games won their other board game things. And on one hand, I can sit there and say, well, that's just how it is. Let's not worry about these awards. On the other hand, I find this infuriating and almost just willful not caring about the industry. I'm always mind boggled when people get upset at companies like CMON or Fantasy Flight. They're like, they made another expansion for whatever the game is that they made an expansion for. Oh, this is just a money grab. Oh, this is, you know, Munchkin, the newest set, blah, blah, blah. Really? That pales besides what Hasbro and Pressman and Mattel do, where they just pump out garbage. Literal games that are almost no pieces at all that do no promotion that is i mean don't step in it is literally about not be blindfolded and not stepping on poop play-doh and that is the most innovative game of the year and if it was the public who votes on these things and people who like going shop at mass market but this is the toy industry and this is some people who are trying to set themselves apart and we look at you and it's like come on now are you kidding me 
That's what wins. And then you expect us to look at it and go, mm-hmm, interesting. I look at that and go, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't call yourself a toy expert if you think that's the most innovative game that's out there when we have the life and death of Billy uh, Kerr out there and we have these escape room games that are out there and all these things that really are interesting and could work in the mass market. <laughs> now, I know that this can come across as a bit of a, well, we're better than they are and stuff. But sometimes we have to call a spade a spade. If some, the Restaurant Association of America, not, not, you know, if I went and, and, and went to a school and asked the kids, what's your favorite burger? And I'm like, McDonald's. Okay, that's what they like. But if the Restaurant Association and Gordon Ramsay came in and said, the best hamburger in America is McDonald's, I would look at them and say, you're lying and you know you're lying. And that's how I feel about this shy tag award type stuff. They know these aren't the best games out there. There's people in this industry and they know there's these better games out there, but they are more concerned about what is selling. Poop games are selling. Yay. Ah, it just bothers me sometimes, that sort of thing. And then we come back to earth and say, does it really matter? We still have thousands and thousands of fantastic games out there. So while I can get a little outraged, right, at the end of the day, I can come back and that doesn't really affect me. Whatever the award shy tag gave out doesn't affect me. And you say, but Tom, there's people out there who will never learn about these great games. Yeah, they will, because the internet exists. And the internet exists and we have YouTube channels and review sites everywhere and people are promoting these games. And while I can get annoyed that Mojo didn't, uh, Top Mojo didn't put in, uh, you know, maybe these other games, they did put in Carcassonne, Catan, and Ticket to Ride, and those games wouldn't have shown up 10 years ago. So yay, progress. And progress is being made and there's many great games coming out. We're at the point now where we're complaining that there are too many games that come out right now. I think we'll be okay if Shy Tag wants to give an award to Don't Step In It. So I can sit there and go, hmm, and then I move on because A, doesn't affect my life at all, and B, those other games are already out there. Also, there's other great awards to take a look at and follow along with those. So there you have it. Those are my thoughts. Tell me what you think in the comments. Let's keep moving. It's your turn. Ooh. All right, Randy. I'm Ellen. Hi, guys. Um, today is the day after Thanksgiving. For and those in America. For those in America. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just got done pigging out uh, on leftovers, and we're outside now. We're on thanks second Thanksgiving. That second Thanksgiving is what we call it's it. It's just a Friday after. Yep. Um, we don't have a game because we just wanted to let you guys know that we're going to be at Pax, Pax Unplugged. Pax Unplugged. Yeah, I'm going to get us a name. Uh, we're going to be at Pax Unplugged, and we're actually going to be hanging out at the Dice Tower booth. From noon to 2 on Saturday. Yes, noon to 2 on Saturday. So if you want to come say hi, that'd be awesome. We'd love to see you and hang out. Um, I plan on having a dang fun time. How oh, about yeah. you? Yeah, it'll be a lot Playing of fun. Playing some games, meeting some people. Yep, and uh, we're going to be there all night gaming, hopefully. Until hopefully. even the wee hours, 11, yep. midnight or so. Yep. Um, yeah, so we'd love to you know meet up and, and try to find as many people as we can. and. Play some games. Yep, absolutely. I'd like to try Dinosaur Island if anybody yeah, uh, nice. wants to bring that specifically. Somebody bring that game. I'll play. Hint, hint. You want to try it out. <laughs> uh, but anyways, you guys have a great week, and hopefully we'll see you at PAX Unplugged. See ya. Bye. So codenames duets. Should we just say everything? In <laughs> at the same time? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Codenames code duets, duets on it Gaming with, with the, the People. people. In this game, you're trying to get your partner to guess certain words. We actually ditched our quintet. That's what five is, right? A quintet? Probably. For this duet. Oh, now you harmonize with me. All right, well, we're better at the game than we are at the duetting. Actually, I was first introduced to Codenames at a girls' night by a bunch of ladies. We played Codenames Disney, and then it took a turn and we played Codenames After Dark. Oh, well, who's it by? Scott Eden and... I don't have my glasses on. It, it wouldn't help. Vlada Shvzera. I think my top was I got Dan to guess five at once. Yeah, I think we had five. We guessed five. One turn, guys. You are very good at coming up with the word and the number, and I'm really good at guessing. It's teamwork. The other way around, we struggle. 
But if every single time you gave the clue and I guessed, we'd win every time. I'm really good at that every part. Time. Which so. is because I'm also really good at being a ghost in Mysterium. Yeah, and I'm really bad at being everyone yeah. in Mysterium. We don't play Mysterium. We do not. It's a top secret co-op game. Oh, I do like that it's co-op because um, it gives us both the opportunity to win. Yeah. <laughs> now, we've never actually dabbled in this part. This is just to add a little bit more um, uh, variety to it. we varies up the gameplay and adds a little bit more I don't know, maybe we'll do this at some point to kind of spice it up when it gets a little stale. Wow. Okay. I basically like all the party games, I think. Any game. Well, and it's rare to have a party game that's good for two. That's Because most party games, you need like lots of humans. And, who, who and all has of ours lots are of tiny. humans to play with that can. Well, we, we made lots. Not chew up the cards. Yeah, that's true. They drool a lot. Hello guys, it's Cardboard Rhino and welcome to One More Rhino Says Yes. Today's game is a very special roll and write puzzle where you get to create railroads and highways. It comes out in two gorgeous editions. It's of course Railroad Inc. Railroad Inc. is pretty straightforward and it's played in a total of seven rounds. In each round you roll the four dice and all players have to simultaneously draw the results on their own board. The only restriction is that each piece they draw has to be connected to one exit or to a previously drawn route. And of course, the railroads can connect only with the railroads and the highways with the highways, creating some interesting shapes and routes with some overpasses and stations. Once per round, but three times in total per game, the players can choose to also use one of the special routes that offer them more complicated connections. At the end of the game, each player counts their points for the connected exits, getting more points the more exits they were able to connect together. For the longest railway, the longest highway, Highway, the amount of squares drawn in the central space and last they subtract all the points from ends of routes that don't connect with other routes or with the outer edge of the board. You can play the base game with any of the two editions but each of them comes with two different expansions. The deep blue edition features rivers and lakes whereas the blazing red is all about volcanoes and meteors. I really enjoyed playing this game. It's a fantastic puzzle that you have to solve and each of the four expansions forces you to think in a different way. It has some meditative quality to it when you focus on your drawing and it also challenges you to calculate what you should expect and find the most efficient or creative way to connect everything. It plays up to six players but you can also play solo and it's a game that you can play almost anywhere in a cafe, in a pub or as the theme suggests on a train or next to a lake maybe not on the road or next to a volcano but it's a game that you're gonna have multiple settings and occasions to enjoy so right now says yes to railroad inc you should definitely give it a try hello my name's dan this is cora and we're here today to talk to you about board games for young children and today we're going to be talking about this game the color monster the color monster Monster. Colour Monster is a cooperative game based on a children's book. In it, the Colour Monster has mixed up all his emotions and the players are working together to sort them all out again. On their turn, the player rolls a dice and moves to a coloured patch which is associated with an emotion. Reds for angry, greens for calm, blacks for scared, yellows for happy, things like that. Then, they've got to give an example from their own life of a situation that makes them feel that emotion. Then, if there's a coloured token on that patch, they try and fit it into a matching jar. And once they've matched all the tokens into the jars, they've got, they're going to win. However, if they uncover too many mixed up jars, then the players lose. Now, I appreciate it that it would be very interesting for other people to actually hear what Cora was saying about her emotions for this game. However, after a bit of reflection, I've decided that's just a little bit too invasive of a privacy. So I left it out. So I, so I do apologise for that. However, that is an indication of the sort of kind of interesting and relatively deep conversations that can come up while playing this game. And that's really a good thing. So, Cora, what do you think about the colour monster? I think it's good. I think it's really good. Because, like, 
like, um, when you have to get that to come back too far away. That's on the other side of the board. Do you know what I really like about it? I really like the fact we can talk about what makes us sad and what makes us yes. angry yes. and things like that. And it makes me realise what you're thinking sometimes and stuff like that. What makes us calm, angry, what makes us calm, scared, angry, sad and happy. That's right, that's right. All, all very important emotions to have. Um, really like this one. I can see this doing really, really well in some kind of... Um, Oh, I don't know, in a, in, a, in a therapeutic setting, even. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, helping children to work out how they feel and things like that. Mm. I think, I, I, uh, and the other thing about this is I, I love the pieces. You might not be able to pick up really on the on the overhead camera how big and say? chunky the pieces are, but they, they're gorgeous. No, what does that say? Help the monster to identify his emotions. <laughs> so, we give Colour Monster two confused emotions Thumbs up. So I've really been getting into Magic the Gathering, but I promised I wouldn't get myself into opening booster pack nonsense. But you can also use booster packs as an add-on item to get your Amazon order over the shipping cost, so it's free. Kind of. So I've been I've been buying a few. Booster packs are a funny thing though. Uh, they're kind of like Schrodinger's cat, which is not a perfect analogy. Also, I'm more of a Pavlov's dog kind of guy. But what is this booster pack worth? I mean, it cost me about three pounds, but the contents could be worth a hundred quid or it could be worth absolutely nothing. I mean, the Schrodinger's cat analogy does wear a little thin, but it does change the way I value a booster pack. Would I sell this on for three pounds? No. Because at the moment, the value of this pack could be anything. If we weigh more, it could be way less, but it's not three pounds. Unless, unless it is three pounds. And that's where the problem lies, because that is kind of exciting, but I won't hold my breath. <sighs> Stupid cat. Bye. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks everybody for joining. As always, I'm thrilled that you guys were here and watched this show week after week. We wanna make it better, we wanna make our channel better. We are coming up close to the end of the year, only one month, already thinking about things that are changing in 2019. For one, you may have noticed that our video editor, Derek Porter, is leaving us, heading back home, and we're gonna miss him greatly. We're sorry that he's leaving, uh, but happily, we have many great candidates who, about folks coming in. In fact, I've already, already found someone to replace them. We'll talk about that as time goes by, uh, but I'm excited about the future. We have several changes that we're gonna be making, all positive changes, I hope, in 2019. And I think you guys will like a lot of the things that we're gonna be doing over the year. And we'll talk about that more as we get closer to January. And our Kickstarter comes in January, where if you like what we do, you can help support the Dice Tower in that regard. But that's not what we need to worry about right now. Right now, I'm worried about chili feast, chili feast steaks, chili cheese steaks. Man, I am spoon rizzing all over the place today. Thanks for watching today's tower. If you're at PAX Unplugged, I'll see you this week. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and this has been Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.